You're listening to Quantum Harry the Podcast, a podcast version of the book Quantum Harry, A Unified Theory of the Potterverse by B. L. Purdom. Episode 13, Deus Ex Machina. This episode is part two of a three-episode arc examining the role of toys, games, and especially fairy tales in the second Harry Potter book. So if you missed episode 12, I suggest going back to that before proceeding with 13. In the last episode, I looked at a lot of works by authors besides J.K. Rowling, Jane Langton, Philip Pullman, Nancy Farmer, J.M. Barrie, in which children's development has been arrested in ways that are similar to or can be considered symbolic petrifaction, which is what happens to multiple characters in Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets because of the basilisk. I also looked at the way that the soul and volition are related, and how separating people from their souls or volition is depicted in some of these other works as well. In this episode, I'll continue to examine Chamber of Secrets, specifically how J.K. Rowling made this book her version of the classic fairy tale Little Red Riding Hood. Many readers have rightly seen traces of famous myths in Chamber of Secrets, such as Persephone and Hades, in addition to the abundant sexual symbolism in the book. In episode 3, Iron Maiden, I compared Ginny Weasley to Persephone because they both embody the archetype of the Maiden, and Persephone's return from Hades each spring was similar to Ginny's return from the Chamber, which brought her world back to life, the way that Persephone's return each spring also reawakens the world. However, Little Red Riding Hood is the story that really pervades the book, and this positions the second Harry Potter book at a very important place in a young adult series. After this, Harry is spiritually mature and no longer needs rescuing. As rewritten from numerous folk sources by Wilhelm Grimm, Little Red Riding Hood is a Pentecostal tale. Pentecost is the Christian holiday that comes 50 days after Easter, and many people consider it to be the birthday of the Christian church. In the book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 1 through 31, the story of Pentecost is told when the Holy Spirit appeared as tongues of fire on the heads of Jesus' disciples, after which they could speak in languages they previously hadn't known, making it possible for them to evangelize to people who couldn't have previously understood them. Some biblical scholars consider this to be the flip side of the story of the Tower of Babel, in which God was supposed to have been upset about humans having the presumption to try to build a tower reaching heaven. So they all suddenly started speaking in different languages and could no longer understand each other. They sounded like they were babbling, in other words. In his book, The Bible and Literature, Northrop Frye says that the Tower of Babel story is considered to be a tale that prefigures the Pentecost story, or foreshadows it, as well as flipping it. We go from an angry God confusing human speech to prevent them committing an act of hubris, to the Holy Spirit making it possible for humans to speak the language of the other in order to spread the gospel. By the Middle Ages, Pentecost was traditionally when young people in Europe were confirmed and joined the church, after which they would be considered adults. Wilhelm Grimm was aware of all of this when he added the woodsman to Little Red Riding Hood as a savior figure in order to avoid the sin of Pelagianism, P-E-L-A-G-I-A-N-I-S-M, which is the idea that humans can be saved from damnation without an outside agent to make up for the original sin stemming from the fall in Eden. Basically, Pelagianism is the polar opposite of divine providence, a theological concept which was very important to Grimm. Grimm's religious motivation for rewriting many old folk tales as religious poetry are documented by G. Ronald Murphy in his book The Owl, the Raven, and the Dove. Murphy asserts that Grimm also rewrote Hansel and Gretel to conform to this religious ideal. In early versions of that story, the brother and sister escape from the witch who'd been fattening Hansel in a cage, and they return home under their own power, whereas Grimm confronts them with an unbridged river, which creates the necessity for them to rely upon what Murphy calls supernatural transport. Murphy, who's a Jesuit, equates this with God's grace and the intercession of the Holy Spirit. Now, an outside agent, or a savior, being necessary in a story to avoid blasphemy wasn't an idea created by Christianity. Long before Wilhelm Grimm or Christianity, Greek playwrights used the deus ex machina in stage dramas. 
The god from the machine, which is what deus ex machina means, was an actor portraying a god who was lowered or raised onto the stage by a mechanical device, bringing proclamations concerning the characters and tying off any trailing plot threads with the wave of an omnipotent hand. Today, the deus ex machina in any kind of writing is considered a trite, easy solution. When it's called out, it's not usually because a critic wants to praise the author for avoiding blasphemy. Many critics of this device may not even know it had anything to do with blasphemy. But if you're going to criticize this in pre-modern works, you need to recognize that it was originally meant to show respect. It was an embodiment of a common belief that crossed religious lines, that human salvation was in the gods' hands, not our own. There are people who today still adhere to this belief, and people are still writing works with a deus ex machina of some sort, quite deliberately. The insertion of a savior into Little Red Riding Hood isn't Grimm's only manipulation of the story. The Charles Perrault version is a cautionary tale. The girl and her grandmother are devoured by the wolf at the end, which is abrupt and violent. This is followed by a pithy moral about being wary of wolves, not all of whom run, quote, on four legs. The smooth tongue of a smooth-skinned creature may mask a rough wolfish nature. There's yet another version in which the girl and her grandmother defeat the wolf with their wits, but Grimm would have had the same issue with that that he had with Hansel and Gretel getting home on their own. Perrault's story of Red Riding Hood has blatantly sexual overtones. For instance, the wolf has the girl join him in bed, but Grimm omits this. Perrault and Grimm seem to want the story to either be about sexual or spiritual awakening, while Rowling enmeshes both elements in Chamber of Secrets. Murphy discusses Perrault's and Ludwig Tieck's versions alongside Grimm's. In Tieck, the girl is looking forward to her confirmation and receives a red cap from her grandmother. Murphy writes that this most likely stems from, quote, a folk custom of wearing red in honor of the Feast of Pentecost, when confirmation is customarily administered. If Perrault's is a cautionary tale and Teek's is an early horror story, his ending is both humorous and gory, then Grimm's is an allegory of receiving salvation by the grace of God despite being a flawed sinner. The girl in the story is said to be sweet, and everyone who lays eyes on her is fond of her. We can easily transpose this description to Ginny Weasley. Grimm's heroine receives a red hood from her grandmother. Ginny's red hair is her chief distinguishing physical trait, a legacy from her parents and grandparents. Murphy cites Bruno Badelheim calling the red hood a sign of female sexuality, while in Murphy's reading of Grimm, it is a sign of the moment of spiritual maturity due to the tie to Confirmation and Pentecost that's more explicit in Teek. Again, one can see sexual and spiritual maturity being equated, just as it is in Philip Pullman's His Dark Materials books, which I talked about in the last episode. Early in Grimm's tale, the girl is told not to go off the path on the way to her grandmother's. In Chamber of Secrets, we learn that Ginny had a similar warning from her father. Near the end of the book, Arthur Weasley says, What have I always told you? Never trust anything that can think for itself if you can't see where it keeps its brain. Both girls are going to a place connected to their family heritage, and they're on the cusp of knowing the difference between good and evil, of being sexually and spiritually mature, but they both fall prey to a tempter. When Red Riding Hood first encounters the wolf in Grimm's story, she's not afraid, because she, quote, did not know what a bad animal he was. Ginny thinks of Tom Riddle as, a friend I can carry round in my pocket. Murphy calls the girl's reaction a statement of prelapsarian innocence, which means innocence like Adam and Eve had before the fall, before they knew about good and evil, which also seems to be how we're supposed to regard Ginny. This may be why Dumbledore holds Ginny blameless. The fault lies with the wolf, Tom Riddle. Murphy points out that earlier versions had Red Riding Hood meeting the wolf in the village, while Grimm moves this to the woods. Entering the woods, quote, is to enter one's grandparents' and parents' world, the continuum of the ancient awareness of right and wrong, by becoming capable of doing good and doing wrong. This is the equivalent for Ginny of going to Hogwarts, where her parents, grandparents, and other ancestors learned to use magic responsibly, where they learned to discern the right path. Murphy sees the wolf as the Germanic equivalent for the serpent in the garden. He mentions the wolf Fenris from Germanic mythology, who at the end of the world is to kill the god Thor and be killed by Thor's hammer at the same time. 
Like Thor, Harry's emblem is a lightning bolt, his scar. This encounter between Thor and Fenris in Norse mythology is eerily similar to Harry's battle with the basilisk, since at the moment that Harry kills the beast, he is also penetrated by one of its fangs, which contains poisonous venom. It's undoubtedly no coincidence that in the sixth book, which mirrors many elements of the second book, Rowling introduces a character called Fenrir, a werewolf who makes it a habit to prey upon children. In The Hero with a Thousand Faces, Joseph Campbell describes the battle at the end of the world involving Thor, Odin, Fenris Wolf, and the World Serpent. He writes, The dog Garm at the cliff cave, the entrance to the world of the dead, shall open his great jaws and howl. Fenris Wolf shall run free. The world enveloping serpent of the cosmic ocean shall rise in giant wrath and advance beside the world upon the land, blowing venom. Odin shall advance against the wolf. Thor against the serpent. Thor shall slay the serpent, stride ten paces from that spot, and because of the venom blown, fall dead to the earth. Odin shall be swallowed by the wolf. Wolf and snake are conflated in Chamber of Secrets. Both the basilisk and Tom Riddle, who plays the role of the wolf from the fairy tale, are snakes. There may have been numerous sources known to Grimm in which a wolf is linked to the devil. So equating the tempting wolf of the fairy tale with the tempting serpent in the garden hardly seems like a stretch. Another parallel is that, as an adult, Riddle changes his name to Voldemort, but most people in the wizarding world say, he who must not be named, or you know who. This is similar to folk customs that forbid people to say the name of the devil, substituting things like Old Nick due to superstitions that to name the devil is the same as invoking or summoning him. Similarly, no one wants to invoke or summon Voldemort by saying his name, and this game becomes very real in the seventh book. When the wolf asks Red Riding Hood where her grandmother lives, she replies, Under the three great oak trees, underneath them are the hazelnut hedges. In this passage, Murphy believes that Grimm is indirectly referencing a Germanic god, Odin, to whom the oak is sacred, which again reminds the reader of Fenris, the adversary of Odin and Thor. The fact that it's three oak trees, however, evokes the Trinity, which brings the symbolism into Christian times. The hazelnut reference can be considered another pagan element, since, according to Murphy, the hazelnut hedge marks off sacred space in Germanic mythology, hazel sticks being placed in a circle to create the sacred space required for a judicial assembly with divine sanction in ancient times. Thus, the hazel image is that of a place of contest and divine judgment. Rowling converts the hazel to the myrtle, moaning myrtle. Myrtle the plant can be grown as a hedge, and is known for its thick, protective, impenetrable foliage. It's also a symbol of Aphrodite and love, and the myrtle flower was often included in bridal bouquets, as I mentioned earlier. Rowling may also have liked the Jewish story, if she knows it, of a woman accused of and killed for being a witch, who was turned into a myrtle tree after her death. Part of the lore surrounding the tree also says that if you chew myrtle leaves, you can detect witches. Like Ginny, who is symbolically swallowed by her wolf, Red Riding Hood is swallowed whole by the wolf. This allows the hunter to cut her and her grandmother, who was eaten first, out of the wolf's stomach, where they are alive and well. Murphy writes, The hunter's identity as the savior, as Christ, is shown in the resurrection of the two women, ancient and new, from the death which comes through succumbing to temptation, sin. Even after he deceives good persons, their souls still shine with the red glow of their gifted spiritual light even in the darkness of his belly, until Christ comes and descends into the darkness of their death and performs one of the favorite mysteries of medieval Christianity, the harrowing of hell. Harry is the woodsman slash hunter slash savior in Rowling's version, descending into a metaphorical hell to save Ginny from the wolf slash snake who has tempted her, deceived her, removed her volition, and drained most of her life force. Unlike the woodsman, Harry is not the character who is the deus ex machina. Another entity assists Harry, and this, in addition to Ginny's red hair that's the equivalent of a red hood, adds even more Pentecostal imagery to Chamber of Secrets. 
despite Rowling presenting a child-slash-young adult as the protagonist, which means he should be the one to resolve the plot, she seems to be using the deus ex machina in the first two books to distinguish between Harry the child and Harry the newly born hero, which he cannot become until the end of the second book, after he spiritually matures. In the two books in which Rowling uses the deus ex machina, Harry is still inarguably a child, and his achieving salvation on his own is implausible. He hasn't acquired the skills or maturity. But he does have wholeness and purity of heart bestowed by an outside force, his mother Lily. Her love, the power of wholeness, protects him and prevents Quirrell from touching Harry without doing himself irreparable harm. Harry did nothing to accomplish that. He is saved by outside agents active before he was born, in addition to Dumbledore, another deus ex machina in the first book, who pulls Quirrell off him when he returns to Hogwarts. Rowling uses the deus ex machina in the second book when Harry makes his statement of faith in Dumbledore, the god figure who embodies the godfather variant of the wise old man archetype. This simple statement of faith brings Fox the Phoenix to Harry in the Chamber of Secrets. Fox is carrying the sorting hat, and Gryffindor's sword is inside it. Fire is the thing most associated with the phoenix, through which it dies and is reborn. As I mentioned earlier, the story of Pentecost says that Jesus' disciples saw the Holy Spirit appear as tongues of fire on their heads. This is a sign of their faith, their belief, and when this happens on Pentecost, they receive the ability to speak in other tongues so they can spread the gospel. Fox symbolizes the Holy Spirit, but when he appears in the chamber, creating Harry's Pentecostal moment, Harry already has the gift of speaking to those who are the other, which occurred when Voldemort made him the accidental Horcrux. This ability is displayed early in the first book, when Harry talks to the snake he frees from the zoo, but it isn't named until the second book, in which he has this symbolic confirmation or bar mitzvah. Harry is about to turn 13, which is the commandment age for Jewish boys. Preparing for a bar mitzvah includes learning to speak an unfamiliar language in order to read a portion of the Torah during the ceremony. Afterward, the boy is considered to be a man, a responsible member of the community who must perform mitzvot, or good deeds, and he must go on a fast at Yom Kippur. No matter how you look at it, Harry is past his prelapsarian innocence, as Ginny is also after the diary is destroyed and she awakens. It's also of note that Jewish girls studying for their bat mitzvahs often celebrate their age of majority at the age of 12, not 13, and Ginny is approaching her 12th birthday. After the incident in the chamber, Harry and Ginny are both spiritually mature, responsible for their moral decisions, whether you want to think of the experience as a symbolic confirmation or bat slash bar mitzvah. It serves the same purpose as any spiritual coming of age. Like Grimm's hunter, Harry uses a weapon to slay the basilisk, though a snake is standing in for a wolf, rather than the other way around, which is what we get in Grimm's story. Harry uses the serpent's tooth itself to stab the diary, freeing Ginny from the metaphorical belly of the beast. They both leave the chamber, having spiritually and physically matured. Rowling again makes good use of Fox, her symbolic Holy Spirit, by having him heal Harry so he doesn't die. Fox also bears everyone out of the symbolic hell of the chamber. Having reached this milestone, Harry doesn't encounter a deus ex machina at the climax of the next book, and in each subsequent book, Rowling also refrains from using this device. It had its place in the first two, but it would be inappropriate in the rest of the books. Harry now has the ability to save himself and others, and no longer needs an outside force for his salvation. The savior of the wizarding world needs no other savior. Grimm didn't include his woodsman to cop out, and Rowling doesn't rely on Fox to help Harry because she couldn't think of something else. He plays a very specific role as the embodiment of the Holy Spirit, and allows us to see that Harry was still a child earlier, though he was on the cusp of adulthood, and needed to cross over into adulthood before fulfilling the role of savior to all of Hogwarts, but specifically Ginny, who represents all children who stumble before learning the difference between right and wrong.
As I mentioned in episode 11, the seven thresholds Hagrid crosses with Harry in the first book also each align with one of the seven books in the series. The first threshold was when Hagrid brought Harry to Dumbledore in Surrey, Dumbledore being the best embodiment of the wise old man, the archetype ruling the first book in the series. The second threshold Hagrid crosses with Harry again involves a water crossing. He delivers Harry's Hogwarts letter to him in the hut on the rock. If J.K. Rowling hadn't made Uncle Vernon desperate to flee the letters, Hagrid wouldn't have needed to cross water to reach Harry, and Harry wouldn't have needed to cross water with Hagrid again to leave the rock. I believe Rowling did this quite deliberately to manipulate the circumstances because she wanted Harry to cross water with Hagrid again, another symbolic rebirth for him. The link between this episode and the second book is that Hagrid is delivering a letter to Harry, a piece of writing. And in the second book, the character who best embodies the maiden, the ruling archetype for that book, is Ginny Weasley, who features prominently in Rowling's version of a classic fairy tale and who spends the better part of Chamber of Secrets writing in Tom Riddle's Cursed Diary. You've been listening to Quantum Harry the Podcast, a podcast version of the book Quantum Harry, A Unified Theory of the Potterverse by B. L. Purdom. All music heard on Quantum Harry is composed and performed by B. L. Purdom. To ask B. L. Purdom to be a guest on your podcast, send a Twitter direct message to at QH Podcast. Next time on Quantum Harry, episode 14, The Devil's Game, the conclusion to this three-part examination of toys, games, and fairy tales in Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. I hope you'll join me. (laughs) Thank you.